Chai with Manjula presents NRI, A Closer Look, a special series that focuses on some of the key issues that affect Indo-Americans and NRIs and takes a close look at solutions and prevention as well. Welcome to Chai with Manjula. Last time we had a discussion about preparing for old age and death, mostly things that we could be doing at our end. But now we also need to build a support system around us. As the first generation immigrants are getting into their late 50s and 60s, they are desperately looking for retirement communities that are culturally appropriate. We know of one such community in Florida, it is called Shanti Niketan. We often see their ad on TV and wish that there was a Shanti Niketan in our area also. Well, it is possible to replicate the model and today we'll find out how to go about it. NRI, A Closer Look, presented by Chai with Manjula and sponsored by the Tech Museum of Innovation, San Jose, California. A unique hands-on technology and science museum for people of all ages and backgrounds, which inspires innovations for the benefit of humanity. And Development Alternatives Group, a non-profit organization in India that brings together traditional knowledge and modern science for sustainable development at the community, national and global level. Joining me now from Florida is Iggy Ignatius, the founder of Shanti Niketan. Iggy, welcome to Jai with Manjula. Thank you, it's my pleasure. First of all, congratulations on the huge success of Shanti Niketan. We have heard so much about it and we all wish that we had one in our community. And I believe it's a complex with more than 170 condos. And today I would like you to tell us what uh, programs and projects do you offer? Sure. Uh, if you look at the target segment that we are catering to at Shanti Niketan, most of us came here in the 60s and 70s, professionals, and are beginning to retire now. Mm -hmm. And most of us have a yearning inside us that we want to go back to India and retire. But practically it's not possible because our children are here, our grandchildren are here, and the medical facility in India is not as good as in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we in Shanti Niketan have actually recreated a piece of India here. And if you look at why people go to India, the number one we go, we say is, oh, we want somebody to cook our food for us. We have servants and maids. Okay. Uh, and then I have people of my own kind around me. And that's exactly what you get. In fact, when the ladies come to Shanti Niketan, and they see the food facility and the very thought they don't have to do grocery shopping anymore, no more cooking in their life and no more doing dishes, yeah. there's a sparkle in their eyes. I know, I would move in there right away. <laughs> so we cook our own Indian vegetarian food in our commercial kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, which is located in our uh, huge clubhouse. Okay. And we, uh, the second major thing is we have everybody's of our own background. It's a gated community for added security mm -hmm. and we have a lot of cultural activities. Okay. You know, celebrate Diwali, Holi, you know, every festival mm -hmm. and there are a lot of social activities. Uh, example, we have philosophical discussion groups, mm -hmm. we have investment groups, okay. uh, yoga and meditation, mm -hmm. bhajans, every day at 12 o'clock we have bhajans. Mm -hmm. There's a music group who performs every Saturday, there's a cards group. Mm -hmm. And then we also make uh, international trips. Wow. We try to organize at least two international trips with the focus being Indian vegetarian food okay. and uh, senior friendly food. So how, what will it take to replicate this model uh, uh, around the country? Uh, there are two parts to this project. Mm -hmm. First is the builder project, the development. Okay. where we raise capital and we are like a regular any builder, we build and we sell. Mm -hmm. The second part is the non-profit part, which is the operational part. Okay. Now the operational part is done completely on a non-profit basis, on a cost sharing basis. Okay. So much so that the cost for a couple to come and live here is $1,000 for oh, two people. That's amazing. Now that includes food, vegetarian food, all three meals, coffee and tea anytime mm -hmm. for two people, utilities, condo fees and property taxes. Okay. So this is the model we can replicate anywhere. Okay. And to replicate it, 
we have come up with an idea because people have been calling me from all over the world actually, not just the United States, mm -hmm. from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia, England. Mm -hmm. So we have come up with a model that we can build a hundred condo project with the clubhouse negated community, just like Shantini Ketan in Florida. Okay. If 25 people come forward and are willing to put down the cost of their condo, not their selling price, mm -hmm. but the cost of the condo up front as capital for the project, okay. I will come in and I will help them build a hundred condo project. We will sell the 75 condos to outside people okay. and the 25 condos will go to these original people. Now, these people who come forward get two benefits. The first major benefit is they get a condo at cost, okay. not at the selling price, but at cost. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we make profit selling it to the other 75 people. Okay. That profit we share with them. With that, each one of those 25 people get a very decent return on their investment mm -hmm. from the time they put their money mm -hmm. until the time they get their condo. So we can replicate the model in any city like this. Okay, so let me see if I got it right. To replicate it in other cities, 25 families have to come forward and buy it at cost and pay you up front. And then you build a 100 condo complex in that city and you sell the other 75 at the regular selling price. And the first 25 investors share the profit. Exactly. And and the operations are non-profit. It's a great model. Have you built some other communities also like Shanti Diketan in the US or outside? In New Jersey and in Malaysia, we are ready to hit the ground. In fact, New Jersey is being launched in April, which is next month. Mm -hmm. And Malaysia will start the work sometime this summer. Okay, and uh, before we go, I can't wait to hear the special announcement that you are going to make on our show. What is it? Yes, uh, there are two announcements. Uh, one is uh, people, especially who are already residents of Shantini Ketan and many others from around the country, have been asking me, this is fine, this is an active adult community. But in another 10, 15 years, we are going to need something more than this. So heeding to that call, we are starting the construction of a 32-bed assisted living facility. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. This will be a one of two buildings. There will be a total of 64 when we finish, mm -hmm. but the first 32 will go operational in March of next year. Okay. That's the first announcement I'd like to make. Mm -hmm. The second announcement actually targets a different segment of people. The first segment of Shantini Ketan and assisted living facility are for people like you and me who have come, who are professionals, mm -hmm. who can actually take care of ourselves. But there is another forgotten sector of Indians in the United States today, mm -hmm. whom we have brought here. Mm -hmm. You know, we have brought them here to look after our children and grandchildren. And after our children and grandchildren have grown up, most of us take care of our parents. But there are quite a few, quite a number of them who live with their siblings or children in big mansions, mm -hmm. but they have told me, Higgy, we do not live with dignity. We get SSA, we get Medicaid, we get food stamps. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you can do mm -hmm. where we could live with dignity? So that's where my heart goes next. And I want to build Shantini Ketan Ashram, okay. where you would take these destitute and of them till they die. And the whole thing is going to be done on a donor donation model. We are going to be collecting donations. Many people have already promised me across the country mm -hmm. to support me in this future. But more importantly, I need a lot of volunteers from every town and city okay. who will back us up in this venture. Mm -hmm. So both of these uh, new projects are wonderful, the ashram and the assisted living. So it looks like you have all the solutions to our problems and answers to our prayers. It's a remarkable project. I congratulate you and thank you very much for having me on the show. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for the time and thanks for the work that you are doing. Chai with Manjula presents NRI, A Closer Look. Next, we'll talk to a well-known retirement planning specialist in the Bay Area, Anil Gulati of Gulati Financial and Insurance Services. Anil, welcome. 
Thanks, Manila. Thanks for having me here. Well, you have been doing uh, financial planning for over 30 years now. So I'm so glad that you are here to tell us a little bit about preparing for old age. And the first question I have for you is estate planning. You know, what is involved? Who needs a will and uh, who needs a trust? And what are the laws about inheritance tax and all that? Wow, wow, wow. That was, that's a mouthful. I mean, that's a lot of questions, shot, one shot. All right, and very you little know, time. And, and but 30 years don't make me sound so old, Mark. You know, no, you started young. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. See, regardless of health, age, or wealth, mm -hmm. there are five basic critical documents which everybody needs. Okay. One is like a durable power of attorney. Okay. Another one is advanced medical directives. Mm -hmm. Then there's a basic will. You got to have a will. Okay. And then there's like a you know intent, a letter of intent, letter of instructions, uh -huh. or actually I call it family love letter. Okay. You know, it's about very personal issues. Okay. Specify and everything. List everything. Exactly. Your wishes. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. And then there is a living trust. So these five are basic for everybody. Okay, I have a question about the will. Mm -hmm. What is a will? If I write something on a paper, does it become a will or it has to be a legal document? So it has to be a legal document, but the idea of a will is that you want your assets going over to your next generation or your for the inheritance purposes. Mm -hmm. It's an orderly disposition of your assets. But will that count if I leave it on a paper, signed paper? Ah, uh, it can be challenged. Okay. So that's why it's better to have a little bit more official. Which is what? Which is having it through an attorney, okay. having it drafted correctly, having uh -huh. all the provisions. Okay. And the other thing is where the living trust comes in. It's it's a yeah. it's an advanced form of a will, basically. That's what I wanted to know. Yes, what is yes. a trust? Okay. You know, I mean they are innumerable trusts. I mean like we can get into in fact this discussion we cannot have because of time wise and everything. Okay. You know, depending on your net worth, you can get into very high sophisticated planning. In fact, mm -hmm. you can plan from the grave after you're gone. You can still be, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, dictating terms from there. But for right now, let's suffice it to say mm -hmm. that living trust is a basic document. If you don't have it, there are lots of negative issues. The state of California, for instance, we live in California. Uh -huh. Right. They will decide for you how the assets are passed over, mm -hmm. which may not be akin to what the person wants. Okay. And then the advanced medical directors. That's a very important area, Manjula. Mm -hmm. And what is involved there? There you got to again see the medical technology is so advanced now. Mm -hmm. The physicians are able to keep you alive indefinitely. Oh yeah. In fact, okay. if I give for the uh, uh, the uh, viewers of the of the show for the audience, you remember the case Terry Shivo case back in 1990 in Florida. In fact, she had a cardiac arrest. They revived her, mm -hmm. and guess what? In 1990, she went into a coma. And the husband, the family, they were at loggerhead, they could not decide. And she was kept alive on life support till guess what? March 31st of 2005. Wow, that's a long time. years they right, kept her alive right. because she did not have a living will. Okay. She did not have it specified. Okay. okay. She didn't have the advanced medical directive. Mm -hmm. So in order to avoid this, right. you got to make sure you have that in place. Okay, okay. Uh, Got it. So uh, now as we grow older, we need to simplify our life and our investments. So what kind of investments are appropriate for this stage of life? In fact, that is such an important question, what you, what you posed. You know, the asset is like asset allocating. Mm -hmm. Asset allocation changes with age. You go from an accumulation stage to a distribution stage. Right. And the whole emphasis changes. Mm -hmm. And actually, for the benefit again of the audience, I don't want to get too technical with all the correlations and the variance and all that. Let me give you an analogy. Uh -huh. You know, there's a chocolate cake, uh -huh. there's a pasta, uh -huh. and then there is uh, uh, like a pancake. Okay. You know, all three very different you know things, mm -hmm. but the the same ingredients. They have the eggs, 
the flour uh -huh. and perhaps some kind of liquid, it is the consistency or the mix which determines what is the outcome. Okay. Similarly, in asset allocation for a, for a portfolio, mm -hmm. it all depends how much you carry or what and the recipe determines what is right for you. So what is a chocolate cake here? Ah, chocolate <laughs> can be stocks, can okay. be bonds, uh -huh. can be you know, alternative investments, uh -huh. which are you know, like, uh, like annuities or you know, different mix of investments. All those have to be mixed in order to come with the final ingredients, the final, the final result, you know. Okay. So you can be more aggressive when you're younger, but mm -hmm. for seniors, uh -huh. the key is to have basically a preservation of your principal, your nest egg. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are not going to come back at the age of say 70 or 80 and say, hey, I'm going to go back to work if you mm -hmm. lose some money. Mm -hmm. Here, preservation of principal and lifetime income that is very important, Manjula, uh -huh. because, you know, people are living longer. Right. Longevity. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. You talk to people today, when people retired in back about, say, 25 years ago, uh -huh. you know, they retired at 60, 65, and they lived for another 10 years, 15 years. Right. But today's retirees, if you're retiring at, say, 65, yeah. you're looking at 30 35 years ahead yeah, of you right, right, and you have to plan for that. You cannot come mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to go to work at age Yeah, eight. you stop working at 60 and then you have another 30 years to live. Exactly. Right. So the right mix has to be there and uh -huh. make sure that the income which you're deriving from your assets mm -hmm. lasts you a lifetime. Okay. That's very important. Okay, I know we don't have that much time, but one more quick question for you about insurance needs. So uh, what type of insurance should we carry and for how long? And tell me about both the life insurance and the long term care. Oh my God, that's again, again a very. <laughs> we have to have you back area. for a longer talk yeah, later on. Exactly. <laughs> but in a nutshell, life insurance is good, it's risk management. But see, seniors do not realize that when they took some policies way back, it was for the, uh, protecting the family kids, they had to go to college, they had to have some protection. Mm -hmm. Today, all that is done. So except for estate planning needs where you have to pay estate taxes, uh -huh. the emphasis of insurance changes. So it's more, in, in our opinion, we suggest having long-term care okay. as part of your life insurance package, meaning a lot of people have life insurance. Uh -huh. They're insurance rich, mm -hmm. but cash poor. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have, they are waiting to die to get the benefit to come in. Mm -hmm. That's where long-term care kicks in because you should have the money coming in mm -hmm. when you have a problem. You're in a nursing home. Uh -huh. You are being taken care of at home. You don't want to be dependent upon the family. You don't want to be dependent upon the kids. Mm -hmm. So you want the liquidity at the right time uh -huh. and the new plants today offer these, these are called combination plans, mm -hmm. where you buy insurance policy with a long-term care rider, okay. whereby that kicks in, mm -hmm. and if nothing happens, there's a death benefit, we should go to the family tax-free. So when you pay for a plan like that, uh -huh. you are going to get the benefit one way or the other, either the living benefit through a long-term care, or a death benefit from the way the family will get it, and they can use the money to pay the state tax okay. or needs or whatever. Okay. So, and long-term care, uh -huh. it is such a big area because 70% there's a chance that people will use long-term care, whether it's right. a nursing home. Because they live so long now. Exactly, right. exactly. You know, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. I mean, mm -hmm. I could go on and on mm -hmm. how that has become a bigger problem, especially when you live longer. Uh -huh. When you live longer, yeah. Alzheimer's setting in and all kinds so of issues. So many other things. Exactly, exactly. So, mm -hmm. that's... It's very important to have the right plan, okay. you know, which is to have the insurance policy with the long-term care rider as opposed okay. to having a pure life insurance. On Got it. Am I? Yeah, no, that I makes know. sense. Well, thank you very much, Anil, for this valuable advice, and we'll talk to you some other time again, hopefully. Manja, yes. thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank this was a coming. pleasure. Enjoyed it. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, that concludes our discussion about some of the challenges and options for the aging NRIs. Kailash Joshi gave us a detailed checklist last time about preparing for old age and death. You can catch that show and this one too on chaiwithmanjula.org. Anil Gulati just gave us some valuable information about managing our finances, investments and insurance needs 
as we enter our golden years. And today we also found out how we can develop a retirement community like Shanti Niketan in our area. Not only that, we also learned that Shanti Niketan is launching a project for assisted living and an ashram for destitute seniors. And all these three models can be replicated in other cities too, which is really heartening. In the coming weeks, we'll take a close look at the challenges faced by the other group of seniors in our community. Seniors who come from India later in life to join their children and we'll explore options available to them. Welcome to our special segment, Technology Benefiting Humanity. My guest today is Talence Orme, Senior Manager of Volunteers and Training at the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose, California. Talents, welcome. Thank you, Manisha. The mission of the Tech Museum is to inspire the innovator in everyone. And last time when we talked, you told us that you have a large volunteer base to depend on. Tell us how do the volunteers help the tech carry out its mission? What role do they play? Well, the good news is they have a variety of different roles that they can play. Um, we rely on them primarily to do a lot of interpreting of the exhibits. Um, in the Tech Museum, many of our exhibits are hands-on, hands-on learning, mm -hmm. as opposed to an art museum where you just kind of point and look, but you can't touch. Okay. So the one thing that we, we find interesting about our museum is things have to be explained a little bit so the kids and adults know how to operate it. Mm -hmm. But once that happens, usually that's when the, the, the joy and the magic begins. So from our standpoint, we rely on our volunteers primarily to interpret some of those exhibits, to explain mm -hmm. the basics, but then allow the creative mind of children but also adults to run wild and that they can make and create whatever they want or mm -hmm. whatever they choose to, to make. Um, but we also have other positions as well. We also have after hours volunteers that help us for evening events. We have mm -hmm. Uh, uh, engineering volunteers that help us in the engineering department. So we have marketing volunteers that help us in the marketing department, mm -hmm. IT uh, uh, volunteers that help us in the IT department. So whatever their creative mind can imagine, mm -hmm. that's probably, we probably have a volunteer helping us somewhere okay. to give us some role or some insight into how we can make the tech museum the best it can be. Mm -hmm. Last time you mentioned that they, you have about uh, 300 plus volunteers. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the school kids you yes. know, volunteering there. But tell us, what other age groups do you normally have there who are volunteering? Um, really, I consider us to have kind of a three-tier system. We have our high school and college aged. So probably you know, anywhere from your 24 to 17 to 24 age group. And then you have your uh, kind of in-between uh, either in between careers or transitioning between mm -hmm. jobs. And that's really because sometimes it could be 25 to 45 to 50. And then we have our retirees who are retired from their professional careers, but mm -hmm. they choose to uh, spend time with us to tell and teach uh, kids and adults about the technology field or maybe a particular industry that they have interest in. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of the three uh, different tiers that we have. But each of them play a, a critical role in explaining their passion and their joy for technology. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the fun projects that people enjoy getting involved with? Um, one of the fun projects that we, the, the uh, adults and even the high school kids and college kids enjoy is sometimes we'll have open make at the tech. And what that is is we'll have different um, uh, exhibits or different ideas and creators that will come to the tech to bring their invention, their creation, mm -hmm. and then we'll have volunteers assist in that activity. Um, it's a very fun activity that can happen. There's also other opportunities that we're bringing to the tech where we're doing partnerships with other creators. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we do have a temporary exhibit at the tech. It's called Reboot Music. Okay. And that's another uh, a digital music uh, gallery where we have many different uh, creators of different uh, digital music technologies that are in, that would be on display right now at the tech. And we do have a volunteer that will kind of walk around and help mm -hmm. uh, explain some of those uh, interesting and fun technologies in the mm -hmm. museum. Okay, so there's something for everyone. Oh, absolutely. Okay, it certainly is a fun place to volunteer. And how do people sign up? Uh, once again, they can just go to our website, www.thetech.org. Just go to the, our link, click on About Us. There's a drop down that says Volunteer. And once again, there's plenty of opportunities for everyone. Okay, wonderful. Any message for our viewers? Uh, once again, the, vol the volunteering is ready and available for anyone who chooses to come to the tech. 
We're a great place, uh, not just for volunteers, but for anyone who just wants to come. Um, I hope that uh, if you find us at the Tech, that you will find a place that you can collaborate and enjoy and uh, be creative and let your innovative side run wild, because we're here to inspire the innovator in everyone, including ourselves. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you, you Terence, very much for coming. Thank you, Manjula. Well, the Tech Museum of Innovation is a fun place for people of all ages to volunteer. For more information, please go to their website, www.thetech.org. And now it's time for Reflections with Jessie. Last time she talked about betrayal and offered forgiveness as the most effective tool to address it. And today she'll talk about how to embrace forgiveness. Here is Jessie. Welcome to Reflections with Jesse. Last time we had talked about betrayal. Most of us have known the pain and hurt of betrayal. When we are wronged, it is human nature to want to lash out. But we do have a choice. We can hang on to our hurt, anger, resentment, and a desire to get even, or we can let go and embrace forgiveness. Forgiveness is neither instant nor easy, but it's worth striving for because it's liberating. Forgiveness is considered a trait of the divine. To err is human, to forgive divine. We've all heard that. But why should you forgive? If someone has wronged you, it does not seem right to let them get away with it. By forgiving the wrong, Aren't you sanctioning the behavior? On the other hand, if you hold on to grudges and emotions of resentment, anger and hatred, you are allowing corrosive feelings to take over your consciousness. These feelings hurt even more and furthermore threaten your health and well-being. Very often, people who hurt are wounded themselves, carrying scars and acting out their own fears and insecurities. Forgiveness entails empathy. It stretches the capacity to understand and perhaps also take into account our own part in the drama that was played out. It may not be possible to become best friends again but we can move on. Through reflection and prayer, we can bring peace and feelings of non-violence in our heart. Pray for the person who hurt you. It is the hardest thing to do, but it, it is also one of the noblest. It is the most effective tool to shine light on darkness. There are inspiring examples of forgiveness in all traditions. When Jesus was crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is very often the case with people who hurt or betray. They are deluded by their own ambitions or fears. Swami Vivekananda cited the example of a mother who never curses or holds grudges against her child and is forever the epitome of forgiveness. The Sikh scripture, Sikh Guru Granth Sahib, states, Jaha Shama Teh Aap. Wherever there is forgiveness, there is God. We're encouraged to enshrine forgiveness as a jewel in our heart. Forgive others, forgive yourself, and release from your heart the poison of anger and hurt that comes from betrayal. Thank you for watching and remember, always be in Chardikala, eternal high spirits. Our thanks to Jesse Kaur for such inspiring thoughts. Forgiveness is neither easy nor instant, but it is liberating. Words to hold on to. That's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to seeing you again after two weeks. Thank you.